Hey T Heads, this is Don from Mayleaf. In this video, T Masterclass Astringency. In this video, I'm going to be geek diving into the concept of astringency, and then I'm going to be sharing with you some tips on how to control astringency when brewing your tea. This video is going to go under the T Masterclasses playlist. If at any point in time you enjoy this video, then make sure you hit it with the thumbs up. The more thumbs in the air, the more tea videos are going to come your way. And if you haven't subscribed to our YouTube channel yet, go click that button. Astringency is a fundamental part to tea appreciation in exactly the same way as with wine, beer, coffee, whiskey, and chocolate. And I have to say that a lot of what I'm going to be talking about today applies to those foods and drinks too. And since astringency is so important to tea appreciation, I thought that I would share with you all the knowledge that I have about astringency and then show you ways that you can tweak astringency so that you can make the perfect cup of tea for you. I have to say from the outset that the science around astringency is not fully clear and is always changing. I've written a fuller article. I'll put a link in the description below as well as scientific references. And of course, if any of you have comments that you would like to share, then please stick them in the comments section below. All right, let's begin. First of all, what is astringency? Astringency is often confused with tastes like bitterness, but it is not a taste, it is a physical sensation. It comes from the Latin ad stringere, which basically means to bind quickly and refers to any chemical compound which causes the body tissues to constrict and pull up. In the mouth, this is represented by a sensation of dryness, of puckering, and is often associated with things like dry red wines, teas, and dark chocolates. Next up, is astringency in tea a bad thing? Absolutely not. Tea astringency is so important with quality teas. It adds physicality to the tea experience. So when you're appreciating tea, you obviously have the visuals of the leaf and the color of the liquor. You have the smell, you have the aroma, you have the taste, but you also want to have the texture and the finish. And that is where astringency comes in. It means that you have this physical sensation, this physical appreciation of the compounds and nutrients in the tea. And the experience lasts long after you've swallowed. If there's no astringency, then the experience ends after you've swallowed and you're left with a very soft, flat, and quite short finish. That dry sensation that comes with astringency will transform in your mouth sometimes and you'll get all of these extra experiences minutes after you have swallowed. And of course, that lingering dry sensation in the mouth makes you want to go back for more and have the full experience again. Of course, different people have varying preferences on how much astringency they like in their tea. However, in my experience, it seems to be a universal rule that the more you appreciate tea, the more you appreciate astringency. So how do we actually sense astringency? Well, this is where things get a little bit complicated. So please bear with me while I run through some of the science around sensing astringency. One of the most common misconceptions that you will see written all over the internet from Wikipedia to wine websites to tea websites is that the sole cause of sensing astringency is proteins binding with polyphenols. So the theory goes like this. Your saliva contains proline rich proteins that actually add to the lubricating or slippery feel of your saliva. And when you drink tea, the polyphenols in the tea bind with these proteins to make larger insoluble molecules. So it's actually removing these proteins from your saliva and therefore your saliva is actually less lubricating and less slippery. There are problems with this theory though, and it's probably not true, or at least only partially part of the truth. So if you take polyphenols that we all as human beings consider to be astringent, and you test them with saliva proteins, not all of those polyphenols will actually bind with the proteins. So that makes the theory suspect. Also, if you buy this mechanical uh, theory of astringency, then you would have to be moving your tongue in order to sense it, because if, you, if, you, if your saliva has less lubricating effect, then you would need to check it by moving your tongue. Well, as we all know, if you drink tea or you 
drink wine or you eat chocolate, even if your tongue is still, you still sense this feeling of puckering and dryness. And so, this mechanical theory of astringency is probably not the case or only part of the truth. I've read studies which show that the trigeminal system is crucial to sensing astringency. So your trigeminal system is responsible for sensations, for picking up sensations such as touch and temperature. And you have a variety of different receptors. Um, and the uh, studies have shown that astringent polyphenols cause reactions in the mouth which set off the trigeminal system. And certain receptors, when stimulated in the trigeminal system, relate to astringency. The most likely receptors are the ones that also pick up extreme heat or react to chili, which is TRPV1 for those of you, of you who are interested, or ones that pick up very cold, like mint, which is TRP, TRPA1. And usually if you're picking up astringency from TRPA1, it, it has more of a sensation like a catching in the throat. So those two receptors seem to be implicated in um, sensation of astringency. But why, you might be asking, is it that when you eat hot chilies or you eat mint, it doesn't cause astringency? Well, there is another uh, system in play here and those are your taste buds. So your taste buds um, have many different types of receptors. And it seems to be that it's the combination of on-off of these receptors which leads to astringency. So if your TRPV1, which is your hot receptor for on your trigeminal system, is activated and the bitter receptor is activated in your taste buds, those two things go together and your brain records astringency, which is why bitterness is often associated with astringency, but not always in the case. And so the conclusion is, and it's a, there's a lot to go through here and the science is continually moving, but the conclusion is that there is a chemical uh, response to polyphenols, which set off receptors in your trigeminal system and your taste buds, and the combination of the two and the different combinations of on-off of the different receptors cause astringency and probably cause different types of astringency, which is why in tea, we all know as tea heads that there are different types of astringency. There's different types of dryness and puckeriness. There's different um, experiences that you have. And so it may be that it's a combination of taste buds and the trigeminal receptors reacting to different signals. And then you throw in that mechanical uh, protein binding theory and it could be that all three are implicated in the sensation of astringency. Okay, so up next, which chemicals actually cause astringency? Well, in food and drink, the most common class of compounds to cause astringency is polyphenols. Polyphenols are created by plants and some animals, and they have a whole host of functions from controlling growth, protecting against UV sun radiation, as is the case in tea. They also prevent microbial infection. They uh, bring about pigmentation, amongst other functions. So polyphenols are very valuable compounds made by the plant. You may have heard of the term tannins. Tannins comes from the old German word tanner, which means oak or fir tree, and actually historically relates to the polyphenols extracted from these trees, which were used to tan leathers. So that the coloring, the pigmentation of leathers. But nowadays it relates to all sorts of large molecule polyphenols. Catechins, which are the polyphenols in tea, is a kind of tannin. However, it really can't technically be called a true tannin because you can't use it to tan leathers. It doesn't have pigmentation and it has a low molecular weight. And so it's classed a pseudo tannin. But for all intents and purposes, we can call the catechins a tannin. What we can't call it is a tannic acid. So if you ever hear about tannic acid or tannic acidity, that doesn't relate to tea. Tea does not contain tannic acid, which is a very particular type of tannin. And so tannins exist in tea, they exist in wine, both from the, the seed uh, in the grape and the skin, but also from the wood cask, which actually adds more tannins into the wine. But in tea, the 
primary uh, polyphenol classes are catechins. And there are many different types of catechins. I'm not going to bore you, but there's so many different types of catechins. And as you oxidize tea, what happens is those catechins convert into larger molecules called theoflavins, which have an orange to red color. And that contributes to the changing of the color in the liquid. So these theoflavins then also get converted into theorubigans. So you've got catechins, lots of different types underneath. They get converted to theoflavins, different types underneath, and then theorubigans. Now studies have shown that the catechins have the most level of astringency. So they are considered the most astringent in subjective testing. And to add even more complexity, the different types of catechins or different types of theoflavins all have their own levels of astringency. And so the balance within the leaf and within your extraction is going to affect the astringency that you sense. So the takeaway points here are that the astringency in tea is caused primarily from polyphenols in tea. There are different types of polyphenols, catechins, theoflavins, and theorubigans. And catechins has the most amount of astringency, but within each, there are varying levels depending on the individual polyphenols involved. Let's move on to the 10 factors which affect astringency in tea. First up is processing. This is the most important factor regarding astringency in tea. As I said before, catechins are more astringent than theoflavins and theorubigans. And as you probably know, green teas or fresh leaves contain the catechins. And as the leaf oxidizes through white tea, yellow teas, oolong teas, and then black teas, they convert from catechins to theoflavins and theorubigans. Therefore, green teas are going to be more astringent than black teas. I know that it's a common misconception out there that black teas are more astringent than green teas. That is not the case. And I think that the, the bad reputation regarding astringency, extra astringency in black tea is due to the fact that most people are brewing the tea wrong. They're using tea bags, which is very dusty, very, very small particle size, and they're brewing it for too long. To give you an example, to demonstrate it, what I have here is five grams of imperial green and I've got five grams of Souchong liquor. So a black tea and a green tea. And I'm going to quickly brew them up. So this is exactly the same weight for weight. Notice the difference in perceived volume. So that's weight for weight. If you brew weight for weight, temperature for temperature, all the parameters the same, then my expectation is that the green tea will be more astringent than the black tea. We're gonna quickly give this a rinse. I am not gonna be talking too much well, at all about flavor actually, because this is all about astringency. And I'm gonna brew these for the same amount of time. I'm gonna intentionally over brew these a little bit so we can really pull out the astringency in them. This is 90 degree water. I'm gonna fill up to the same place here, which is filled guy one. Here we go. Right, so we're gonna put a lid on this and we're gonna brew them the same amount of time. I've got my Gong Fu Guru here, my uh, Gong Dao Bays. Another factor in processing is roasting or heating. And studies have shown that when you roast a tea, or just heat it, but roasting especially, you reduce the amount of polyphenols. And therefore, polyphenols is the key here. The more polyphenols, the more astringent your tea is gonna be. So roasting or heating the leaf up will reduce the astringency. And this is very commonly used, specifically in oolong teas, to cut down the astringency and make for a much smoother tea. All right. In goes. The green tea, I have to be relatively quick to try to match the brewing times. And then the black tea. So now we give it a taste. I'm not gonna show you the colors. Obviously, they're gonna be very different colors here. But let's see which is most astringent. So what we're looking for is astringency, not bitterness here. Now this is very, very important because the Souchong liquor here has a real 
depth of cocoa flavors. It's gonna be stimulating those kind of cocoa, dark chocolate, bitter uh, taste buds um, on my tongue. And therefore, the combination of the bitterness with the activation of the trigeminal TRPV1 is gonna make a slightly different kind of astringency to green tea. But in terms of levels, let's see which is more astringent. I'm gonna start with the black tea. So I'm focusing on how dry, how puckering the sensation is on my tongue and down my throat. And it is there, no doubt, but nothing particularly dramatic. Now the green tea immediately hits your mouth. It has this intense pulling sensation, intense tightening sensation. Definitely much drier, a lot drier. Um, and so what you have here is a demonstration. If you take the same amount in terms of weight of leaf and you don't crush the leaf, you don't make tea bag dust or anything like that, whole leaf, same amount, same temperature of water, same brewing time, give or take five seconds, you will get a more astringent brew with the green tea versus the black tea. And that's the case along the spectrum. So white tea is gonna be slightly less astringent than green teas, yellow teas, etc. Oolong teas, light oolong teas are gonna be more astringent than dark oolong teas, etc., etc., etc. Now, there are many other factors involved in astringency, so it's not just this one, but this is the most crucial one. One last try. Very drying, chalky sensation. This one, the bitterness combined with the astringency gives a different sensation of astringency, but it is definitely lower. Okay, number two on our list is leaf size. Now, I just said that one of the reasons why black tea has a reputation for being overly astringent is because we've been brewing it wrong. Too long, but also the particle size is much smaller. And when you reduce the particle size, as is the case with cut leaf or in tea bags, you're increasing the surface area for extraction and therefore you're gonna be extracting a stronger tea. And that means more polyphenols, which means more astringency. So to give you an example of this, I have white peony here. This is a beautiful white tea from Fujian province, white peony. And I am going to take my 100 mil gaiwans here, identical size gaiwans. I'm gonna put whole leaf in this one. And for this one here, I'm actually going to crush the leaf up. So this is kind of sacrilegious, it kind of breaks my heart a little bit. But just to prove a point, I'm gonna break this up, make the particle size a lot smaller. And then if we have like for like, same temperature, same time, same amount of leaf, but we change the particle size, so that's the variable that we're changing, it will, or it should, extract a much stronger brew. Here we go. I'm not gonna rinse these ones. In goes the water on one, and then the other. And already I can see how quickly this is, this, this powdered or broken leaf is uh, extracting by the color of the liquor around the rim. We're not gonna brew these too long but you should start to see a, a noticeable difference in color, and I should be able to notice a difference in the astringency. So to recap, all things being equal, if we reduce the particle size, we're increasing the area, surface area for extraction, and that will make a stronger brew. Okay, let's try to do a double guy one pour here. There we go. Right, take a look at the extraction. You can see immediately, and this was a very, very short extraction, but you can see immediately the color difference. This one is the smaller particle size, a much stronger extraction. I'm going to taste now. First of all, the whole leaf. Oh, lovely tea. Milky, nutty, 
Slight green chestnut, green nut astringency is there, but it's really, really gentle. Very syrupy. Let's go with the small particle size. Immediately, much closer to the green tea astringency that I experienced before. And the position on the tongue is different. With this one here, it's more on the sides of the tongue. But this, I'm getting that real catch at the back of the throat, all across the top of my tongue. Very, very astringent, very drying, very pulling sensation. So there you go. Particle size is your second important factor when controlling astringency. Moving on to our third factor when controlling astringency, and that is temperature. I have here some Diamond Peak Yellow Tea, Junshan Yinjen, a gorgeous yellow tea. I've done a video about this. You can check it out if you're interested. And we have two flute brewers here. So the same amount of tea we're gonna put in one and then the other. And I just wanna get these brewing before I talk about the reasoning behind temperature. So I've got 99 degree water, 210 Fahrenheit, so super hot. We're gonna get that brewing there. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm going to check the temperature and add some cold water to the kettle until it drops down to 80 degrees. This is what we're gonna go for. There we go, 80 degrees there. 81, that'll do. So we're gonna get that brewing. Right, so if you haven't watched videos before about temperature, I'll give you a quick recap. And that is that temperature doesn't just affect the strength of extraction, of course, that's part of it. The hotter the water, the stronger your extraction. But it also determines which compounds are extracted because the compounds in tea have different rates of extraction at different temperatures. And we were talking earlier about catechins and how catechins are the most astringent compounds in tea. Catechins extract very slowly at lower temperatures. But when you hit the leaf with boiling hot water, they will extract very quickly, which is why we are constantly telling you to brew your green teas at a lower temperature, because therefore you are going to be extracting less of those catechins, which will mean that you have a lower level of bitterness and astringency in your green tea. Bearing in mind that green tea is the richest in catechins and therefore you need to control it. So temperature affects not just the strength of extraction, but also the EQ balance of which compounds are released in which quantities, which affect the flavor and the texture. Right, normally I'd brew this for a bit longer, but I'm going to, hopefully, this will have proven the point there was a time difference here between me pouring water in here and here of about 20 seconds or so. So I'm gonna take this flute brewer tube out, keep these lovely leaves for later. I'm gonna have plenty of tea to drink later. And then we will pour, well actually I'll, I'll pour some in and then I'll show you the color of the liquor in comparison to the 80 degree one here and you can see already that the leaf is taking longer to start to, the leaves are taking longer to start to drop, to start to bounce around. When you brew this in the flute brewer, I love brewing Diamond Peak in this flute brewer, you can see the movement of these leaves really, really clearly. So again, parameters exactly the same except temperature. That should be about the right amount of time. So we're gonna Pull this guy out. There you go, get every drop. And let's take a look at the color difference. I don't know if you're gonna see. Not much color difference, but to my eye, this one here is lighter, not just in terms of lightness, but also the hue is lighter. This one's more, slightly more yellow. This is slightly more pale green color. Let's give them a taste. Racing through these teas. Cheers, everybody. 
Surprisingly, still not too bitter because the, ex the extraction time was relatively short, but the stringency is prominent. It's very, very prominent. Really catching the back of my throat, which I think is that TRPA1, the cooling receptor in uh, amongst your receptors of your trigeminal system. Very, very different. Very, very smooth. The aromatics are still there. This is the key. The extraction is weaker, but the flavors are just as prominent in terms of this one and this one. Very, very similar in terms of flavors, but it doesn't have the same astringency, and that one has a slightly more bitterness. So, controlling temperature is your third factor under your control for controlling astringency in your tea. Let's roll through some of the others, which I'm not gonna do a demonstration on. The fourth factor which may affect tea astringency is the variety of the tea plant. Now, of course, the variety of which there are hundreds, if not thousands, will have an effect on the varying different levels of catechins, theoflavins, and theorubigins in your final tea product. There have not been any really rigorous studies done on this, comparing different varieties grown in the same environment, picked at the same time, processed in the same way. And so we cannot make any conclusive statements. What I feel is, and most people out there would agree, I think, is that Asamica varieties, the broad uh, variety of Asamica tends to be more astringent than Sinensis, but I feel that the type of astringency is different, with Asamica varieties tending to have a more transformative astringency, astringency turning to juiciness rather than Sinensis. But this is just subjective. We do not have any scientific evidence to show this. The fifth factor to affect astringency is the altitude. Now it stands to reason that the higher up the tea plant, the more it wants to protect itself from UV radiation from the sun, and therefore it will be producing more polyphenols, which would give an increase to astringency. There have been very, very few studies done on this, but the stu some studies have shown that in uh, Ceylon tea, low growing Ceylon tea, does definitely have lower polyphenols and a lower uh, sensation of astringency in those people who tasted it compared to high-grown uva Ceylon tea. But again, relatively inconclusive, we can say that it makes sense that you'll have more polyphenols the higher up you go, and therefore you're gonna have to control the astringency more when brewing. The sixth factor is the picking season. We always talk about which flush a tea was picked, whether or not it was picked very early in the spring, picked later on in the year, or in autumn stroke winter. Again, not much conclusive evidence out there. However, some studies have shown that the polyphenol content is higher in first flush teas, in spring pick teas. This again would make sense. All of that dormant period during the winter, the uh, tea, Plants have been soaking up all these nutrients from the soil, and therefore you would expect those first delicate uh, buds and leaves from the plant to be rich in polyphenols. The seventh factor is picking protocol. In other words, which part of the plant you are brewing. Studies have shown that the very young leaves, the first leaves, the real tips of the tea plant have the highest level of polyphenols. And again, this would make sense because they are the most delicate, they're gonna be the ones that are most sensitive to UV radiation or being eaten by other insects and therefore will tend to have the highest amount of polyphenols. As you go down the leaf, as the leaf ages, the level of polyphenols reduces and therefore, teas that are made with lower leaves, such as oolongs, will tend to have a lower level of astringency. The buds are very interesting. I haven't seen studies relating to the amount of polyphenols in buds. However, from my experience, it tends to be that buds have lower levels of astringency. Now, this is probably because the buds are kind of multi-layered and cased up like armor, and therefore they don't need as much protection. They don't need as much protection as those first young leaves. And so my experience tells me that it's those young, small leaves that you have to be very careful of when accounting for astringency. Okay, next demonstration, number eight, is aeration. I have some censure here. 
This is our Kanai Midori Sencha. Green tea from Japan. I'm going to brew it up with, I've got 75 degree water here in my Kyusu. Now you may have seen people, especially in uh, the kind of subcontinent of Asia, pulling their tea, which means basically aerating the tea, pulling it between two containers or vessels. If you've seen our Hong Kong milk tea video, you'll see that that's a fundamental part of the Hong Kong milk tea brewing uh, process, that they pull it between uh, two jugs at least three or four times. And I've always questioned whether or not this has an effect. So if you think about it, the catechins converting to theoflavins and theorubigans is an oxidation process, right? And so therefore, any remaining catechins in the black tea, or in the case of green tea, there's lots of catechins, will become oxidized, in theory, if you pull it and aerate the tea after brewing. And so what you're essentially doing is taking a black tea, in the case of teteric or Hong Kong milk tea, and you, or chai tea, you're taking a black tea, you're brewing it ultra strong, really, really over brewing it, which means it's gonna be very astringent. It's gonna be pulling out those catechins. Now remember the theoflavins have less astringency than catechins. The catechins are the ones that you really have to watch out for. There will be in that black tea still remaining catechins and you want to try to oxidize those as much as possible. In other words, convert them to theoflavins so that you have a less astringent brew. That's the theory. So here we have our green tea, a nice strong extraction of that. I'm going to pour this green tea into two Gong Dao Bays, equal amounts, so that I'm relatively equal amounts. That's not bad. Look at the color. Oh. Japanese green teas have this ability to make luminous, luminous color. All right, so now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna transfer this into another Gong Dao Bay and I'm gonna pull a few times here. And what I'm doing is essentially making a very small stream, allowing as much surface area of the liquid to be in contact with air now that the catechins and the uh, nutrients have been uh, dissolved in water, they are now active again. The drying process of the tea leaves stops the oxidation just as much as heating the leaves up and deactivating the enzymes. So now we've got water involved. We're gonna do this a few times, bear with me. And you can use this technique if you find a tea is overly astringent, maybe you brewed it overly astringent, you can use this technique to soften the tea. Now I will say that because it's oxidizing, I'm making a bit of a mess here, because it's oxidizing the catechins, it's gonna be changing the um, taste of the tea as well. One last one. Okay, let's see if this has made any difference to the color. Let me show you. So this is the unpulled tea. This is the pulled tea. Now, I don't know if you can see, but I can certainly see that this one looks more, a slightly darker, um, slightly more kind of orange tones are in this tea. So what's happened is, I think um, that the pulling process has oxidized some of the catechins in the tea liquor. But it's all about astringency here. Did it soften the tea? So first of all, the unaerated. Nice tea brewed at the right temperature. Very, very nice. It has the astringency. Again, slightly more at the back, catching middle of the tongue. Nice, I like that astringency, but it's definitely there. Okay, 
Let's taste this. Yeah, it's definitely softer. Now, you have to pull it quite a few times. You've seen how many times we pull, I, I pulled the tea there. You have to pull it quite a few times, in my experience, for you to really notice the effect. Um, it's certainly not something that you can uh, do with a couple of pulls. And you know, people who say that slurping the tea softens it by adding oxygen, I don't think that that's the case. I think that you're not gonna make any noticeable difference by slurping the tea to convert the catechins into other compounds. But when you pull the tea multiple times, it definitely has a softening effect on the astringency. I will say again, the flavor has changed. This is much less bright. This is much less bright than this one. I actually prefer the taste of this one and I don't mind the astringency. But to prove the point here, especially with black teas, with, with strongly brewed black teas, pulling the tea definitely has an effect on softening the astringency. Okay, number nine is mineralization. A little trick that I heard about was when you're brewing black tea very, very strong, if you add some clean eggshell into the tea whilst it's brewing, it makes for a smoother brew. So I thought that I would try that out. Here I have some eggshell. I've cleaned it, I've taken the inner lining out of it, it's perfectly, perfectly clean. I am gonna put this, break it up, I know it sounds strange, in this pot. I have some Milansiang Dansong, aka Royal Peach Orchid, here. A tea which is renowned for being quite an astringent tea, especially if brewed a bit harder than it needs to be. I have 95 or 205 Fahrenheit water here. I'm gonna give this a quick rinse. Here we go, pour these out. And then I'm gonna brew them, and again, I'm gonna brew it a little bit harder just to prove the point here. So in goes the water here, same amount of leaves, same temperature, same vessels. We're trying to standardize the process completely. The only difference is that this one contains eggshells. So what I've done here is I have taken water, boiled, put it into this little shot glass, and I've done the same here with eggshell. And the reason why I've done that is that the common reason for why this technique reduces the astringency is that it increases the pH of the water. In other words, the eggshell makes the pH of the water more alkaline. And I wanted to test this. So I've got a pH meter here, and I'm gonna put it into the water that was unaffected by the eggshell, and that's showing me a reading of eight, so slightly alkaline, seven is neutral. And now in the eggshell water, and that's showing me a reading of eight as well. So it really hasn't had much of an effect in this small amount of liquid. In fact, no effect. I am a bit suspicious of this alkaline theory. Um, and that's because really alkaline, people who are selling alkaline water are also saying that the alkaline water extracts tea much quicker. And if that was the case, then you would expect more polyphenols and therefore even more astringency. Let's pour these out now. So this is the one with the eggshell. and then the one without the eggshell. Let's see if we notice any difference in color. Here we go, you can be the judge. So no eggshell versus eggshell. I personally do see a difference in color. This one looks darker to me but it is very, very, very close. Not much in it, in my opinion. Right, what I'm gonna do is I am going to pour a little bit in this shot glass, just let it cool down, and this one in this shot glass. And now I'm gonna taste and judge the astringency as we have done before. 
So with the eggshell, don't forget I brewed this extra strong. Astringency, astringency is definitely there. More front of the tongue, which goes to show, I think there's different receptors being involved here. Bitter, slight bitterness and astringency on the front of my tongue and middle of my tongue. Nothing particularly extreme. Let's go for this one. Right, in my opinion, and it is for me quite pronounced, this one is more astringent than this one. I do think that the eggshell trick works and I've tested this a few times with various different teas and you have to put a fair amount of eggshell. You saw I put half an eggshell, half an egg's worth of eggshell in this small pot, but this is the first time I've tried it with Dan Song. I notice a perceptible difference. This is softer. But as you've seen, the pH is not affected. This is still 8, 8.1. Hardly any difference. Let's put it into the T. 7.1, 6.8, 6.7, 6.9, 6 T, the T has had an effect. Let's see if this is the same identical, 6.6. .6. So there you go. I don't think that the eggshell has any effect on the alkalinity. I mean, it will, theoretically, because the calcium in the eggshell will, um, is, is alkaline, so it will have an effect if you use a lot of, of eggshell. But you can see here, for this small amount of water, not a big deal. Right, now I've got a TDS meter, which measures the total dissolved solids in the water. This is showing me a reading of 4.6.2. This is showing me a reading of 5.5.6. Five, so a definite difference in the dissolved solids, which is what you would expect because we've added the calcium and all the other minerals in the water. This T, 7.4.8. So the T has added more to total dissolved solids. And this one, 7.8.7. Seven. So you can see that the total dissolved solids definitely has been affected by the eggshell in both the water and the tea. And it's my feeling or theory that it's the mineralization of the water which is causing this softening effect in the tea liquor. And that brings us to these little fellas, right? You've all heard, or you should have, of clay pots. This is a Chow Jo, this is a Zersha clay pot, and we all talk about the fact that the main reason, apart from the beauty and all of the craftsmanship, but the main reason for using these pots is to control astringency through the mineralization of the tea whilst it's brewing from the clay. I think that this eggshell method is kind of like a shortcut. It's not gonna be exactly the same thing, different minerals, of course, but mineralization of water has an effect on astringency. I can't give you more facts than that, but it's very, very interesting to see that it's the mineralization and not the pH which has this effect. Finally, number 10, your final factor that controls astringency is any additions that you add to the tea. So if you add fats, as in the case of milk in black tea, then those fats actually turn off TRPV1, the receptor, the trigeminal receptor, which we think is associated with astringency. Similarly, lemon juice, lemon, the acid in lemon, uh, replaces the polyphenols that bind to TRPV1, and so for, therefore it will cut astringency too. You can also use things that stimulate the cooling receptors. That will tend to turn off these TRPV1 receptors as well. So things like bergamot in the case of Earl Grey, or potentially mint as well, which is often used to soften the astringency of strong black tea. So you can make additions to reduce astringency, but 
I also think, and this is my personal experience, that quality teas naturally have ingredients which transform bitterness. And this is one of the key quality markers that I look for when I'm selecting teas. The astringency I love, but is there a transformation in the astringency? That is, the def that is one of the defining quality markers, for example, in raw pu'er teas, but in other teas too. And you will notice if you taste some cheap green tea versus some high quality green tea, one of the key differences is after you've swallowed. It's how the, the, the astringency transforms itself. So there are compounds, I believe, in quality tea grown in the right terroir, in the right way, that will actually naturally displace this astringency over time and you'll get this beautiful kind of rounded 3D experience. That's it guys, I'm spent. I've given you all the information that I have about astringency. Make sure if you've got any comments that you put them in the comments section below so we can continue this discussion. That's it, tea heads. If you made it to the end of this video, then make sure you hit it with a thumbs up. Check out our YouTube playlist and let us know if there are any videos that you would like us to make. If you're ever in London, then come visit us in Camden to say hi and taste our wares. If you have any questions or comments, then please fire them over. Other than that, I'm Don from Maley. Thank you for being a part of the revelation of true tea. Stay away from those tea bags. Keep drinking the good stuff and spread the word because nobody deserves bad tea. Bye.